as you've probably gathered, if you've been listening, our theme for today is um, a time to keep and a time to throw away. Uh, something a bit unexpected happened um, a few weeks ago when I posted my, my weekly online reflection on our, our, our YouTube page. Um, usually the online reflection attracts about 50 to 60 regular people, those who like getting up early and just watching it, you know, or can't make church or whatever. But um, at the beginning of August, uh, the numbers started to go up. So, you know, 50, 100, 150, <laughs> even got to the point where um, uh, YouTube started putting in a wee advert. <laughs> so they always put in a wee advert if it's, it's a very popular post. So, they, they, so you had to watch this advert before you could watch the reflection. And I was having a chat with, it, with Laura, our IT person, about it um, afterwards. And it turns out it's nothing whatsoever to do with what I said or, or with the power of my message. It was to do the fact that in the title, I'd used the word declutter. <laughs> True. Um, clutter is a big issue for people all over the world. There are people post like, watching from America all over the place. And what's happening is they've got a problem with clutter in their lives, and so they're Googling the word declutter and our, our online post. So if you're ever involved in doing an online post, take note. You know, there's, there are certain buzzwords that are around. But clearly, clutter is, is a growing problem for people. Um, now, if you've been paying attention to the news at all, you'll be aware that there's an economic crisis looming. And if you've been paying attention to what's going on within the church in Scotland, the Church of Scotland, you'll know that Church of Scotland is having to sort of rethink what's important and what matters and what to keep and what to lose. So um, this is a time when decluttering for us individually or us as a church might actually be a good idea. And a good question for us all to be asking just now is, is, is what are the essentials and what can we live without? What do we need to keep and what do we need to throw away? And Jesus gives us some good advice on that in today's reading. So Jenny's going to read it for us. It's from, yeah, up you come, Jenny. It's from Matthew chapter 6. It's part of the, the Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 19 to the end of verse 24. Treasures in heaven. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in, and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light but if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Thank you, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> you'll know that Jesus was an oral teacher. He, 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 sort of, he didn't have notes, he just went for it. And the people he was speaking to, I'm not sure if their literacy rates were all that high. So he used the method of an oral teacher, and um, he knew the value of repetition. And in this short passage that Jenny just read for us, he, he seems to actually be saying the same thing in three different ways. And what's more, he's getting increasingly blunt as he, he says it. 
He, if he first starts up, he's, he begins by talking about where we see our treasure lying, okay? Uh, and then he sort of repeats that by talking about how we see the world. And then he finally ends up with talking about the danger of worshipping possessions, material things, money. So we're going to look at these three things, but <clears throat> just to keep us on our toes, we're going to look at them in reverse order, okay? We we'll start at the last and work our way back to the first. So the last one, let's read that again. No one can serve two masters, says Jesus. Either they will hate the one and love the other, or they'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Jesus is warning us about the danger of idolatry. An idol, an idol, as Professor Duncan Forrester always used to say in class, is anything that starts to get between us and God. Anything that starts to get between us and God. So Jesus is saying, you have to choose. You can either put your faith and trust in God, or you can put your faith and trust in your material possessions and your money. But you can't do both. Why ever not, we're thinking. Surely we can. Where's the harm in this? Well, the answer is because it will begin to affect our faith. And when it starts to affect our faith, it begins to, to stop us being the, the people God wants us to be and living the lives that we're designed to live, the best lives, life in all its fullness. The first thing, for example, that will happen it, if, if, if we're trying to serve these two things, it'll begin to affect the way we see things. And that takes us to the second illustration Jesus gives. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Instead of looking out on the world and seeing nice things, we'll begin to find ourselves looking out in the world and seeing things that we want to have, we want to possess, we want them for ourselves, we want a nicer house, we want a, a better job, we want a, a nicer car, we want a better holiday than last year. You know, we, we're not to say, oh, that's a, oh thank, I'm glad you had a nice holiday. We're thinking, oh, I'm gonna have one of those too. You know, it starts to affect the way we see things. And our, our days start filling up with if onlys. You know what I mean by if only? If only, if only, if only I had a better kitchen. Like so and so's, oh, that's a nice kitchen. Usually it's something we've seen on telly, oh, that's a nice kitchen. If only I had one like that. Or if only I had a better pension. <laughs> oh, yes. Or if only I had a, a nicer pair of shoes, I'd be a lot happier. You know that feeling? All I need is that and I'll be a lot happier. Or if only, if only I could win the lottery. Oh, if I won the lottery, I'd be the happiest person in the world. Would you? See, that's when you start getting the balance wrong and putting your faith and trust in material things rather than in God. So, what we worship begins to affect how we see things, and how we see things begins to affect how we behave. The final illustration, the first one, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, says Jesus. Good question to ask here is, what does he actually mean by treasures in heaven? What does he mean? Does he mean store up good deeds, you know, like brownie points, like we've got a ledger, oh, that's a good deed, that's going to be a treasure in heaven. Does he mean being kind to old ladies, um, being kind to animals, so that God is really impressed and, and he rewards us when we get to heaven, you know, he gives us a, a special treatment, um, especially good robes to wear. Um, and especially nice seat, you know, is that what he means by treasures in heaven? My, my problem with that understanding is 
that it's still highly materialistic, isn't it? It's sort of like we're swapping earthly treasures for heavenly treasures. We're hoping, swapping earthly materialism for heavenly materialism. And, and it ends up leading to a sort of false piety, the sort of thing Jesus is always criticizing the religious leaders of his day for. And it doesn't actually square with Jesus' own teaching. He says, um, you've got to be humble. You've got to be selfless. For what Jesus has in mind here. If you think about it, he says, don't store up treasures on earth because they're not going to last. You won't be able to take them with you. Rather, store up things that you can take with you, things that will last, both here on earth and in heaven. So what, what sort of things will last, both here on earth and in heaven? I've often quoted Philip Yancey when he says, when you are on your deathbed, what are the things that will really matter? What will this be the things that really matter? Not all the beautiful things you possess, because they're no use to you anymore. Not all the things you've achieved, even if you've got a knighthood. You still can't take it with you. The things that will matter to me, I hope, <laughs> will be the people I love. It'll be the, the members of my family. It'll be the members of my church family. It'll be the people who I'm looking forward to meeting again on the other side. Treasures in heaven. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Rather, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Living treasures. Last week, I, I spoke of how one of the unexpected blessings of those terrible and tedious days of the first COVID lockdown was the blessing of empty skies. <laughs> um, another far bigger blessing, I think, was the blessing of being given the chance to reset and to rediscover the things that really matter in life, like the joy of company and the, the comfort of knowing that you're, you, you're part of something bigger. Um, people who care, people you can care for, the joy of the life-giving joy of being able to serve people with little ways like, like doing the shopping and and, and, and supplying lunches for them. Or, you know, all those little things that we were able to do during lockdown, which were life-giving. These are the things that really matter. And of course, with passing time, as the threat of COVID eases, there's this real danger that we're slowly slipping back into our old ways again. And we're cluttering up our lives with things that we're busy doing and things that we are possessing. And it's, it's, it's like we're, we're, we're losing something here. So good questions to ask ourselves, I think, regularly. When it comes to our time, how do we fill our time? Listen, listen to this. This is a book of daily readings that Lindsay and I are working through. It's um, by Joni Erickson Tada. And she has some very profound things to say. So this was the reading for the 20th of August. You can check later if you want. It says, consider this, or Joni says, consider this. Every morning you are handed 24 hours free of charge. If you had all the money in the world, you could not purchase a single extra hour. So what will you do with this priceless possession? You must use it. And don't forget, once it's wasted, you can't get it back. Every single hour is a priceless possession. That's, that's, that's profound, isn't it? How, how are we using our time? And then the other question, what about all the things that, that, we, that, that we are accruing all our possessions, are they getting in the way of God? Are we leaving any room in our lives for God? 
So those are the questions that are provoked in me by today's theme. It's a time to keep and it's a time to throw away. And there's some questions we need to ask ourselves regularly. But here's a final thought. And then a story. Okay? Uh, a final thought. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is where Jesus tells a story, tells two stories actually, of two different people. Um, and both people have actually come across Jesus and his kingdom. And they've come across it in different ways. One has stumbled across it, oh wow, and the other one has been searching for years and years and eventually found it. But the thing that both of them have in common is once they, they discover this thing, they realize it's worth more than everything else they possess. Paul discovers that too. He, he, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus and he discovers that in Jesus he has something more than everything else he possesses. And in his letter to the church in Philippi, he writes these words, all I once thought gain, I now count as loss. It's worthless compared with knowing Jesus. So in Jesus, we already have the greatest of treasures, whether on earth or in heaven. In Jesus, we already have something that nothing can compare with it. It, it is priceless. The world cannot match it. And all he's asking us to do is to be willing to share his presence, his love, in what we say and what we do. So that's the thought, and here's the story. Let me tell you about someone who I know, I've known for quite a while now, but I, 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 I met in a very profound way just this last week. She has been working in a local care home for the last seven years. She's sort of responsible for all the activities that happen in this local care home, and these last, Few years have been really, really difficult for the care home and particularly for her, trying to organize things for the residents. And on top of that, uh, she is paid a terrible wage. I don't want to get political, so I'll just stay quiet on that one. But let's be frank, she's paid a terrible wage given all the things she has to do and all the responsibility. And she's not very valued. But she loves the people she looks after. And she goes out of her way to bring joy into their lives. And we hold a monthly service in this care home. It's just a short service, it only lasts half an hour. And we, we sing a few well-known hymns and we tell a Bible story and we say a prayer and then everybody joins in with the Lord's Prayer. And most of the patients have memory loss issues so, so, you know, you'd be tempted to think on the grand scale of things, is this time well spent? But something, something amazing happens when, you know, even if you have memory loss issues, when you hear familiar words or familiar tunes, it's like you come to life. Um, and in God's presence, you come to life. So it's a very special time. And the person I'm talking about who's responsible for all this knows this. And so when it's time for our service, she goes out of her way to seek out all the, the, the residents of the care home who she knows have some sort of connection with, with church and with services. And she brings them along in their wheelchairs and she bullies the staff into helping her and, and they all come along and it's a huge effort. And she deals with all the disturbances because there's usually one or two of them as well. And then when we're all gathered there, you know, usually the staff, if, if they, they say, oh, good, um, the entertainers are here, I'll go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> um, but she doesn't. She stays, she turns up the hymns, she looks after people, she gets glasses of water, she deals with people who get upset. And last just this last week we had a service there and it was such a special time it was like a kingdom time you know just a glimpse of heaven because 
all these people that she'd gathered there, there were maybe about, oh, about 18 of us. We came to life in God's presence again. And I know that when that person's time comes, just as, just as it will for all of us, but when her time comes, there will be treasures waiting for her in heaven. And I know, and this is what makes it really special, that the number of those treasures is growing every month. We have in Jesus something really, really, really precious. All he's asking us to do is to make the time to share him in our words and in our deeds. So let's take a few moments and in silence, as we always do, and let's have that conversation just between you and God. Okay, God, what have you been saying to me today? What do you want me to do? <laughs> we thank you, Father, that your gentle call on our life is always easy to hear. So all we ask now is that we, you, would, you would open our ears to your voice and our hearts to your purpose for us. Help us to seek first the kingdom of God, your righteousness, that all may know the greatness of your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.